Hey, welcome to today's video. I'm Prof. Omar. Today we have this really fascinating problem that has a really interesting approach that one would not necessarily like come up with naturally themselves, but it's an interesting way to learn how to use linear algebra in contexts that seem like it's not needed. Um, so the question states the following. You have students in Prof. Omar's class that go for ice cream in groups. And the groups are groups of at least two. And the following is observed. Each group had at least two students in it. And after a certain number, k, groups of students had gone, every pair of students had gone for ice cream together exactly one time. And the question asks to prove that Prof. Omar's class has at most k students in it. So the number of students in the class is at most the number of groups that went on uh, trips for ice cream. Okay, so I want to um, make one observation before we get into the nitty gritty. So imagine you had a student who only went on one trip, right? Or was one part of only one group. Okay, let's call that student maybe S1 or something. Okay, well, since every pair of students um, have gone for ice cream together exactly once, then if there's N students, this person went in a group with all the remaining students because they only went in one group. Well, that means that the remaining students all went on pairwise the same trip. So there's only one group, um, but that contradicts the fact that we have at least two groups. So we can add a stipulation here then that every student goes in at least two groups. Okay, so that'll become useful to us. Um, all right, so how do we approach this problem using a linear, linear algebra approach? We're actually gonna show two different ways to do this, starting with one fundamental observation and then taking that observation in two different paths. So what we're gonna do is, let's say there's N students in total. Um, so N of these. What we'll do is construct vectors, N of them, one for each student. And these vectors are gonna live in R to the K. So K is the number of groups. And so each component is gonna be assigned to one of these groups. Now, what are these vectors gonna look like? The ith vector is gonna be a vector that consists of zeros and ones that tells you whether or not the student was involved on the trip in the jth group where j is the corresponding row. So for example, if student i went on group one, we'd have a one here, not in group two, we'd have a zero, et cetera. And each of these entries will be a zero or a one. Okay, so let's make some observations about these individual vectors before we go about actually using linear algebra to show that there are most k students. Now a note I wanna make, that essentially means that we're trying to prove that n, the number of students, is less than or equal to k. That's our goal. All right, so a few observations about these vectors. The first one is because every single student goes on at least two groups, if we take the dot product of the vector si with itself for any i, it's gonna be at least two because we're gonna have two ones in that vector. And so we'll have the two ones multiplied together in the dot product in one position and the other two ones multiplied somewhere else and added. Okay, and then if i is not equal to j, then the information we're given in this second bullet is that every pair of students had gone for ice cream exactly once, right? So when we look at the vector corresponding with si and sj, they'll have a one together in exactly one of the positions. Otherwise, one of them is gonna have a zero in a given position. So the dot product between these two has, actually has to be exactly one. 
And so this is the sort of linear algebraic information we have about these vectors. I'm going to keep these here and use them for our various proofs. Okay, so let's start with proof one. So proof one is going to be a proof by contradiction, which assumes that the goal that we want is not true. So assume n is not greater less than or equal to k. So in other words, assume that n is actually greater than k. So we have n vectors here, s1 through sn, that lie in rk, and n is greater than k. So that means that this set of n vectors is actually or linearly dependent. Okay, so if the set of vectors is linearly dependent, then we can find scalars a1 through an, such that the zero vector is equal to a linear combination with the scalars of these vectors. All right, now the information that we have about these vectors is the information in this box here, and that information is about dot products of the vectors with themselves. So it would make sense to have some type of algebraic um, object where it involves dot products of the si's with themselves and si's with sj's. We can do that by taking the dot product of this vector with itself. Now the dot product of the zero vector with itself is zero, and then the dot product of this vector with itself is gonna equal zero because this is the zero vector. Okay, so what we'll do is maybe copy this thing here, and so zero is the dot product of these two things. Now there's a few terms that appear here. One is when we take things that look alike. For example, these two will have a1 squared, s1 dot s1, and we'll have a bunch of these up to a n squared, s n dot s n. And then we'll have all the pairwise products. So things like a i s i, and a j s j. Um, so that'll look like the sum i not equal to j of a i a j s i dot s j. Now again, we have some information about these objects. Um, first of all, this thing here is actually one. So we can eliminate this and we'll have just this object here. Furthermore, we actually have that the si.si values are at least two. So what we'll do is incorporate this by adding in the sum i equals uh, one to n of ai squared and subtracting these objects by one. Now a reason to do this is we're trying to prove this by contradiction and you notice here, this thing right here is actually the sum of the AIs all squared. Um, okay, so what we have here then is that zero is some number. These values here, because the SI.SIs are at least one, these things are all at least one. And so this entire expression is at least the sum of the squares of these ai coefficients plus the sum of the coefficients all squared. Now this quantity here is non-negative, but this quantity here, the only possible way that it would actually be zero is if all of the ais are zero, but all the ais can't be zero because we claimed linear dependence so some of these coefficients here have to be non-zero. So this quantity here is actually strictly greater than zero, but we said all along that is bounded above by zero, and we saw we have our contradiction. So kind of a surprising way of going about this, but the philosophy behind this is when you have a situation where you know relationships that have to do with on-off statuses of things, in this example, students being assigned to groups that you keep track of in you keep track of in on app statuses by these vectors which we call indicator vectors. You can use that together with linear algebra to get some information.
So pretty cool approach. Um, now we're going to use a different approach that also uses linear algebra, but does so in a little bit of a different way that doesn't require this um, kind of especially strange step over here, uh, maneuvering around with the linear, in the, uh, linear dependence that we had. So let's take a look at how that's going to work. Okay, so for this approach, we're going to use the same vectors, but we're going to take the vectors and put them in a matrix. So the matrix is going to have these SIs as its rows. Okay, so this matrix has N rows and K columns, because each of the SIs are an RK. Okay, now the information we have is about dot products of the pairwise vectors. We can take a look at that by multiplying the matrix A by its transpose. So we get the matrix that we had together with its product when we have these vectors, the SIs, in the columns instead of the rows. Okay, so what does this matrix look like? It's going to be an N by N matrix whose columns or whose ijth entry, so we take i, j, is going to look like si dot sj. And that's exactly what we have information about right over here. Okay, so we can actually write this in a compact form. We'll have that all of the si dot sj's are one, except the diagonal ones, which are at least two. So we can write this as the all ones matrix plus some diagonal matrix whose entries are all <clears throat> at least one because the diagonal entries of A trans AA transpose are at least two. All right, so I can rewrite this as something a little easier, the one all ones vector multiplied by its transpose, this is the all ones vector of length n. Uh, so it's that one uh, plus this matrix, which I'm gonna call D. Okay, now we'll actually be able to prove that H A transpose is invertible as a consequence of this. And the reason is we can use the matrix determinant lemma, which we actually developed in a different video, which is linked right up here. Um, and it says that the determinant of this matrix AA transpose is equal to the determinant of the matrix D, which is invertible because D is a diagonal matrix with positive entries on its diagonal, times one plus the matrix of all ones transpose times the inverse of D times the matrix of all ones. Now this thing in the parentheses is actually a scalar. Um, we can analyze what it is. So this thing right here is going to be, well, you think about it, this part is going to be a vector whose entries are the reciprocals of this matrix here, because D inverse has as its diagonal entries the reciprocals of all of the diagonal entries of D. So this thing here is the sum of all of the reciprocals of the entries of um, the matrix D. And so this actually is a positive number in the parentheses. The determinant of D is positive. So this is a positive determinant matrix. And so AA transpose is itself invertible. Okay, now why does that help us? Well, let's take a look at the situation that's happening right over here. The matrix A itself is uh, N by K matrix. So it takes matrix in, or vectors in R K and spits out vectors in R N. And A transpose does this from R N to R K. And what we're saying is that the composition of these linear trans these matrices thought about as linear transformations is invertible. So if we take a vector V here, the output of this is A transpose V, and the output of this is A A transpose V. And we're saying that this entire chain is invertible. Okay, well, what does that mean? 
Well, if we're going from Rn to Rn with a linear transformation that is invertible, and we're going through this intermediate Rk, the dimension of Rk can't shrink, can't be smaller than that of Rn. Otherwise, we'll lose information. So it must be the case then that k is at least n. And that is exactly the thing that we wanted to prove as our goal. So another cool way to go about this using a different linear algebraic framework um, that allows us to still establish the same type of inequality, and it still does use linear independence and dependence, but uses it in a way that looks at it from a matrix perspective instead. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, definitely click the like button. If you want to see more videos like this, definitely subscribe to the channel.